thanks a lot to be here the last day at nine o'clock. That is uh, really brave from you, and we all appreciate. So uh, welcome to this first meeting uh, of the Dynamic Coalition on Natural Neutrality. Today we will try to um, analyze the relations between some technical and some human rights perspective of the natural neutrality debate. Uh, in order to, uh, to develop this analysis, uh, we will start with uh, a keynote by Chris Mar Marsden, professor of media law at uh, Sussex University. Uh, then we will uh, keep on with our my distinguished panelists. So Francesca Musiani from uh, Ecole de Mines, Paris. Louis Pouzan, that I would like to uh, uh, call one of the fathers of the internet. Um, uh, Emma uh, Langslow, that is uh, uh, director of the uh, Free Expression Project at the Center of Democracy and Technology. And then uh, Yochai Benevi, that is a uh, policy uh, uh, senior policy, uh, the, the, not pol policy director, not senior policy director, policy director at Access. Okay, um, before um, starting our analysis, uh, I would like to spend just a couple of words uh, to elucidate what is the Dynamic Coalition. We all know that uh, Dynamic Coalitions are uh, in informal groups that analyze a specific topic in the long period. This Dynamic Coalition has been created uh, as an outcome of the multi-stakeholder dialogue on network neutrality and human rights, uh, a conference organized by the Council of Europe. So the Council of Europe has, uh, a, 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 has given a, a great input to this uh, coalition that has been instrumental to raise awareness, to uh, analyze what is network neutrality and spread this kind of analysis, and also to create a model framework that uh, was one of the, of the wishes of the of the Council of Europe since the 2010 declaration on, on natural neutrality. Um, why natural neutrality? It is important today. We have seen during the last days that there are not just technical uh, issues, there are not just competition law issues, there are also human rights issues, there are also consumer rights issues, and uh, today we are in a historical moment in which some regulation has been proposed, and uh, we we feel that this regulation should be good regulation, evidence-based regulation. And uh, so I would like to start uh, with with uh, the key keynote by Chris to uh, know something more about policy regulation and uh, and future of natural neutrality. Thanks, Chris. I'm loud, but it's probably better if I uh, speak into the microphone. Uh, just to say, uh, there is, of course, the, uh, the book um, of, the, uh, of the Dynamic Coalition. My uh, uh, chapter in the book is page 76 onwards. So I'm not going to talk about the technical elements because you can, of course, read them from page 76 onwards. Uh, but I am going to talk about some of the misconceptions about net neutrality. I was inspired by the panel on Wednesday. I don't know if inspired is the word, annoyed by the panel on Wednesday. And, uh, and I want to talk about some things that come out of that. Uh, just to say there is, uh, as you're probably aware, a proposal for a European uh, regulation on net neutrality. It's unlikely to happen before the elections, but we can have a conversation about that. So I'm not going to talk about that directly. Um, I do want to talk about what ISOC said they said on Wednesday. Uh, and they said, they said this, competition law is a key aspect of net neutrality and can provide sufficient answers to many of the emerging issues. That's in the ISOC hi daily highlights. Uh, well, no, it's not a key aspect, and no, it can't provide sufficient answers. Uh, and I have, uh, as I'll refer to, a, a book that explains this a little bit later on. Uh, net neutrality responds to a layers problem. It re responds to the fact that all ISPs, big or small, uh, mobile or fixed, need to manage traffic to some extent. Uh, several claim to be deluged with video on HTTP, and we'll see this is not necessarily the case. Uh, but nevertheless, it's about setting the rules of the road for the ISPs. It's not about big ISPs and small ISPs. It's about all ISPs. So that hopefully sets to rest one myth. Um, part of that myth is, oh, transparency and switching will solve the problem. Well, that's actually a mirage. The more you try, the more you fail. Ofcom in the UK has spent six years tying itself in knots, trying to increase both transparency and switching. 
They've had a desperate attempt to portray this as self-regulation. If it's self-regulation, it's as close to co-regulation as I've ever seen. They're doing as much bullying as they can of the ISPs without actually passing a law. Uh, but the results are, unfortunately, that we have severely throttled ISPs, uh, particularly compared to the United States. Uh, and UK low, uh, users, in particular, have very low upload speeds. So if you're actually trying to put something onto uh, the network, it's very difficult to do so in the UK. Uh, and there's some wonderful work by Alyssa Cooper uh, dealing with this. Uh, you can find it by searching on SSRN.com. It's a paper she presented at the uh, Telecom Policy Conference recently. Uh, Alyssa, as many of you know, is on the Internet Architecture Board and was at the... The Ten Eyes meeting in Montevideo that we talk about. Uh, so this is uh, just to let you know uh, some graphics on the UK. UK, uh, as you can see, has picked up from a very low start on broadband. It's a very late mover in the broadband market. This is particularly shocking probably for our Korean uh, participants to see the UK at the left is at about 3 megabits per second advertised in 2006. And on the right, unfortunately, it's gone off the edge of this screen. The actual UK speeds that you achieve are about 45% of the advertised speeds. So it's even lower than that, I'm afraid. So we're not an example to anybody, uh, but you're not surprised. Uh, so let's just remember that, uh, to just recap from that, ISPs all have incentives to discriminate. Uh, let's not fall into the trap of assuming that dominance is necessary for discrimination or much, much worse, collective dominance. Uh, for my sins, one of the things I do is that I'm a competition lawyer don't try to prove oligopoly and collective dominance. It won't work. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to achieve unless you actually have people recorded saying, let's fix prices in a cartel. That's not going to happen in this case. Uh, so let's rephrase the definition, and let's rephrase the definition in a very simple way of what the actual problem is. Telcos should not be overtly naughty against their users. In legal language, we would say allow only reasonable traffic management. That's supposed to set the rules about what is naughty and what is not. Uh, or for a brand marketeer, don't be evil or at least don't get caught being evil. And this is essentially what the argument is about. And that's not an argument about big or small. Uh, so on the left, you can see uh, some telcos. On the right, you can see some of the people that they would like to throttle. Uh, we won't talk about surveillance here, but let's just recall that what we're engaged in when we talk about discrimination between traffic types is, of course, about ISPs having to exercise some degree of censorship on their own initiative. I mean, all week, all that, seem, that seems to have been talked about in the coffee breaks is states telling ISPs to, to uh, censor communications for the state's wishes or tapping communications on the ISPs' channels, but this is actually about the ISPs doing so themselves. This man is the uh, head, or was the head, rather, of uh, the second largest UK uh, uh, fixed-line ISP, uh, Talk Talk. Uh, and he said seven years ago, we're being naughty. Uh, or and specifically what he said is, we shape traffic to restrict to restrict peer-to-peer -peer users. I get hate mail at home when that means we restrict their ability to play games. I have two people threatening to kill me. That is the kind of naughty moment which you'd have thought a regulator would pick up on. Uh, the UK regulator chose not to. They said he was simply making a joke. He wasn't making a joke. Uh, it was a, just an illustration. He was saying, we throttle. We throttle because we uh, are managing traffic. When we do that, we get lots of complaints from users. Regulators need to act when they get this kind of smoking gun situation where they can see exactly the problem that occurs. It's worth saying that Western Europe shouldn't really have a problem that uh, requires unreasonable traffic management in any case. First of all, fixed traffic growth in Western Europe is low and it's manageable. Uh, the annual uh, compound growth rate predicted by Cisco, 17% per year between 2012 and 2017. That's way below the historic growth rate of the fixed internet. So in actual fact, in Western Europe, we're fine. And in fact, even mobile forecasts are actually falling off a cliff, partly because all of the predictions about the amount of video that would swamp mobile networks, it emerges that actually a great deal of that, the BBC says something like 92 to 95% of that, is actually Wi-Fi onto your mobile handset, not coming off the mobile network itself. And of course, Wi-Fi is fixed. So the video that's being consumed is consumed off the fixed network on the mobile handset. Uh, it's worth also noting for those of you from countries with uh, only three, uh, two or three mobile networks that the analysis that's been done of the actual price of data in, uh, in Europe shows that it's actually the entrance 
that at least initially offer much lower prices than the incumbents. You'll see Vodafone is the giant skyscraper on the left, and Tele2 and Free and Teleosanera and uh, Three are the ones on the right. But we're only, of course, starting to implement net neutrality. Uh, the Netherlands, we've heard uh, the other day that the Netherlands has a law. It's not actually enforced the law so far. So there haven't actually, as far as I'm aware, been any cases. I'd be uh, interested to hear if there have been. Uh, it certainly wasn't in place in terms of the regulation until this year. Slovenia is more interesting. They have a law that was passed just before Christmas of last year. Uh, whereas in the UK, just to summarize, of course, we've had ISPs throttling traffic for over 12 years. Government doesn't care. Uh, but enforcement is actually very easy if you approach it logically. And if that sounds like the beginning of a song, uh, we'll come back to that. Net neutrality laws 2013. So the Netherlands passed a law last year, uh, but it still has to be implemented. So, uh, Slovenia has a law as well. In Chile and Finland, we have access to the unfiltered internet. Uh, the US, of course, has a situation where it has the open internet order, although that's under challenge. Uh, Norway actually has the most effective actual implementation of net neutrality, uh, even though it's uh, so far done by a, by a co-regulation. Although I believe Norway is going to amend its telecoms laws to make this uh, a more specific type of co-regulation. Uh, Canada has rules from four years ago. They haven't really been implemented. There's been some work on usage-based billing in Canada, uh, which has hopefully got rid of some of the problem. Uh, and we have self-regulation in places like Japan and the UK, and still in France, although France is uh, threatening to move towards law. Uh, but we'll see whether that happens or not. Uh, so this is the Slovenia uh, Economic Communications Act. Uh, there's an unofficial translation of that. Uh, the Slovenia Act is much more strict than the Netherlands Act. It's probably much more interesting in terms of a, 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 a strict net neutrality approach. ISPs are prevented from restricting or slowing internet traffic. Uh, except for the usual exceptions, solving congestion, security, or addressing spam. Uh, commercial differentiation of quality of service is actually prohibited in Slovenia. So that's really quite a strict uh, condition that's, uh, that's uh, imposed. Uh, and the ISP is prohibited from different connectivity prices, which is likely to actually affect the way in which they can offer d data caps or not. So I think Slovenia is the country to watch most closely in terms of how it might implement this. Uh, so, returning to the approaching it logically, there are at least 50 ways to throttle your user, as we know. Uh, and the question I think that was, that was left hanging in the air a little bit on Wednesday is who should discover or regulate uh, net neutrality? Well, discovery, particularly for those of you from developing countries, why not use the fact that you're funding all of this fantastic university research? Uh, plus, of course, there are many content providers who are willing to provide you with, with information on what throttling is taking place. Geeks can help lawyers to find blocking and discrimination. And so let's try and have a, a proper effort to do that. In Europe, we spend multi-billions a year on network research, and universities are very keen to help to discover this problem. They're very happy to do so. Um, and of course, they'll only find it, let's just remember, they'll only find, as I said, overt, uh, overt problems, because they'll only find it where it's widespread or obvious. Subtle discrimination will not be picked up even by the keenest research. Uh, and we can maybe have a discussion about that. The regulation will have to happen through the uh, telco national regulators. It must be the way. Um, they, um, they just need probably some retraining to remember that they do have a legal function uh, to protect freedom of expression and user privacy. They've sometimes forgotten that they have these uh, fundamental rights obligations, and it's worth a little reminder to them to remember to do that, uh, to make sure they're not strangely forgetful of their constitutional functions. After all, these are public communications networks, not private communications networks. Um, and of course, enforcement with appeal to courts. Why not? As, as with all other telecoms law. And courts are f perfectly familiar with balancing the rights of economic interests and human rights interests. I don't see anything difficult about that. So let's not make this seem more complicated than it is. Telecom national regulators can, can solve the problem. University researchers and others can help us to find the problems if they exist. And then we can solve the problems via general processes. And, of course, all regulators can, therefore, find breaches. Uh, and we haven't gone mad. We're not all bonkers. We can actually deal with this problem. You're probably familiar with Alice in Wonderland and the uh, Cheshire Cat. Let's not try and make this appear a more complex problem than it really is. Luca, how long do I have left? I think you have still a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, so can developing countries afford net neutrality? Well, you can't afford not to have net neutrality. 
in almost all cases, and of course the West did this as well, we've sold GSM licenses much too cheap. And around the world we see these multi-billionaires doing wonderfully well out of their uh, mobile licenses. Generally, developing countries, and I include the UK in this, at least for these, in this regard, we don't have competition. We have duopoly or at best three-way competition amongst mobile networks. We don't have real fixed line alternative. In the UK we do, but we only have one wholesale network, which is British Telecom. Um, and so it's really net neutrality or bust because when these companies claim to be selling the mobile internet, the amount of throttling that goes on uh, and the amount of preference that takes place, it really is a bit of a joke to claim it's the internet when it's actually not offering open access to the internet. And of course, that's all the digitally divided have in order to connect. So without net neutrality, you're offering them something which is a very different experience to the real internet. Um, and I know a lot of people... Uh, a lot of delegates here have found it very instructive to be trying to use their, particularly their Wi-Fi networks in the, in the hotels and to see what happens when you have quite strong content filtering and quite slow speeds. It's a reminder to us of just the challenges that are faced by users every day um, in developing countries. And I should add to this, at least 10,000 villages in England where they also have very, very slow speeds. It's not simply a, a problem that's in uh, particular countries. So I said I'd just say something very quickly about the past. It all began in 1999, in the last millennium. This is not a third millennium problem. It's a second millennium problem originally, based around fears of cable-walled gardens, um, in particular, the, if you remember, the AOL Time Warner merger. And Lawrence Lessig and Mark Lemley made a submission to the FCC at that time, which was called... This was meant to be a snappy title, I think. For the, it's a snappy geek title. The end of end-to-end, end, they wrote. And that's what they feared uh, would happen. Uh, and it's fears of a closed monopoly model. But remember, this is 14 years ago. Do not allow your politicians and others to say, well, telecom companies to tell politicians, oh, this is a new problem. It's only a problem in the West. It's not a problem we should worry about. At least 14 years old. And frankly, anywhere that's got broadband has this problem. Uh, and of course, uh, the Council of Europe, we mentioned, did have worries about net neutrality. I wrote in 99 a report for the Council of Europe uh, in which we talked about uh, bottlenecks, convergence, uh, and the way in which these things take place, uh, and uh, talked about the problems that occurred. I talked about the fact that in the States, ISPs were asking the FCC to bar cable operators striking exclusive deals on high-speed Internet access so that consumers can enjoy the same open access to services that they now have over phone lines, which, of course, we now call uh, uh, net neutrality, but we knew about it back then. So just to wrap up completely, um, you're probably not familiar with the book. The book exists. You can buy it. You can also find the PDF online on your favorite pirate website. Um, but uh, it actually had 100,000 downloads in the first two months. It's on, it's on a Creative Commons license, I should say, the book. Uh, it's published by Bloomsbury, uh, which is the Harry Potter publisher, as you will all know, I would have thought. Um, just to say, this is some of the research that's been done on trying to find out about uh, where discrimination is taking place. This is by Glasnost, so you can actually see maps of net neutrality violations worldwide. Um, it's going to grow and grow. Uh, I'm, I'm here, actually, in, uh, uh, in Bali through the Network of Excellence on Internet Science. We do a lot of work on trying to put together um, the, the hard technology plus the social science to understand how networks are developing. Uh, we had a conference recently in which we had uh, one of our colleagues now on the Internet Science Project, uh, Professor Ziga Turk. Uh, interestingly, he was actually the minister in charge of the Slovenian Telecommunications Act when it was going through the Slovenian parliament. So within our research group, we actually have the person who's passed the toughest net neutrality law in Europe so far. Um, and there we are. Yeah, just to say, some of you have uh, got a flyer on your desk. It's of the uh, recent book that I wrote with Ian Brown. Uh, Ian's a computer scientist at Oxford. We include uh, some discussion of net neutrality in that. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a, uh, basically a subject where I think we have to ask really good questions. And we're not all bonkers, and it's not all difficult. It's really very straightforward. So I hope I've helped to, uh, to solve some myths that there may be out there about it. Thanks a lot, Chris, for this uh, extremely interesting uh, um, keynote. And uh, I would like also now to ask to uh, Monsieur Poussin uh, to explain. We have heard a lot about quality of service, the fact that uh, the, the problem that can trigger quality of service, the fact that in Slovenia it's even banned, the quality of service differentiation. So I would like to start uh, by you being 
one of the fathers of the internet, you have the honor to have the first question. So what uh, can quality of service determine some interference between users or uh, can quality of service guarantee no interference between users? Thank you, Luca. Well, the, the, question may be, the question may be stated so that it has no solution, you know, always. <clears throat> So in this case, the, the question is, what do we mean by network neutrality? If uh, we have first assumption, more bandwidth that's needed. Second assumption, there is no throttling in the system. In other words, nothing like a three-lane expressway that ends up in a two-lane expressway, and then you have you know, the clogging of the traffic. Well, if we have smooth, this network has been built in a very smooth way, and uh, if users are not trying to abuse of it, then you may have no interference, but that's not usually the case. The case is that we have uh, heterogeneous networks. Where the, net the internet is made up of uh, thousands of uh, in autonomous uh, separate networks, which all have uh, some business to do, sell their bandwidth, uh, make sure they satisfy their major customers, uh, lie to each other when they're peering, uh, when they have peering arrangements, so that they may potentially take advantage of the weaknesses of the, of the neighbor. That means the, the world is not perfect. And it happens that they uh, usually try to sell more bandwidth than they do have, which means that uh, there will be obviously some points where uh, there will not be enough bandwidth for everybody. Next question, do we have classes of services? Well, it's well known that if you have no class of service, I mean, everybody has the same service, that means the big consumers are um, actually funded by the small consumers. The small consumers for, for pay for the big ones, which is obviously not quite satisfactory in terms of uh, uh, equality or neutrality of economics. The second thing is uh, uh, the network is the packet network, the, the IP service, as you know, has been built initially uh, without any discrimination even though there always is some discrimination when you have to, when you have to send packets in some direction and there is not enough, not enough capacity, you obviously have to arbitrate somehow. You may take uh, the short packets first or the longer packet first or uh, the ones that have been longer in the network. There are several criteria which obviously has to be examined in order to uh, avoid uh, complete uh, congestion. That means that the network practically has always been uh, in some way discriminating between traffic. But if we have classes of services, it makes more sense because they have different requirements. So things like voice, uh, things like file transfer, things like uh, uh, mail, uh, things like uh, uh, TV, for example, which need bandwidth, but be, be, which may also be buffered. All those services have different requirements. and. Uh, when I think of uh, a single network which doesn't discriminate again uh, according to services, I think of a hospital in which all patients are treated equally. Um, that doesn't work, you know. Uh, therefore, uh, the the ideal thing is enough, too much bandwidth. I mean, at least enough bandwidth for everybody, and all the networks uh, profiled or uh, parameterized in a way that makes them completely uh, homogeneous, or at least. Uh, ensure smooth traffic among them. I don't think that's realistic. So I guess the networks have to be built in a way they can take advantage of the economics. In other words, if they have, uh, if they have important customers, they have to offer a good service for the, the, the big ones. Uh, and of course, if they don't want to deny service to the smaller one, or they don't want to deny service to those who abuse of big, uh, big bandwidth, uh, then they have to introduce classes with tariffs, and uh, just the same as high-speed train and uh, flights and uh, uh, many uh, many kind of public services. Uh, services may be tariffed differently according to the uh, privileges or according to the the, the cost it makes to uh, offer these services. So I guess we have no other choice uh, if we uh, have to live in a real world. No, which is not necessarily very friendly to each other, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. So for a long, for many, for many years, there was no way to uh, to homogenize a traffic through a a, a, multi, a multiplicity of uh, heterogeneous nets. 
Well, uh, some of our colleagues, uh, which I referenced in my paper, have uh, worked a uh, number of years on that. Well, I'm not a mathematician, so I have no way to, um, to tell you that whether they, they made mistakes or not in their mathematical approach. But apparently, their peers agree that they find a way to predict um, uh, QoS, in other words, end-to-end -end performance across several nets, provided they know the characteristics of the nets, of course. That means, again, you need transparency. If uh, operators hide their characteristics, I don't see we can, how we can do it. But assuming they are somehow more or less pushed to, to, um, um, uh, to, uh, to tell what characteristics they use, and the user, there could be some laws for that. Transparency could be, even though it's not respected, it could be set into, into regulations. Then uh, there are somehow capacity, possibility of predicting the tariff. But predicting is always a game in the sense that it may occasionally, uh, uh, you know, it may occasionally uh, uh, go away from the prediction. That uh, just same thing for car traffic. Car traffic use a common, uh, a common resource, which is road. And it's, uh, typically it's predicted in a certain amount of traffic, but there are some peak times. And I guess that's uh, something will keep happening in networks too. So for uh, providing a reasonably uh, satisfactory services to users, I think it, it should be, it pre instead of having a completely open system in which everything is equal, which is n never true, uh, there should be um, a, 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 a differentiation according to what service is provided. And there should be, for the operators, um, the, a very strong determination to offer in each category of, tra of traffic, in each, in each class of traffic, they should at least offer a minimum service, a minimum QoS service, which is guaranteed any time, at any time, almost any time, because there may also be uh, catastrophes in the net, you know, things, uh, links which are uh, down, and uh, possibly uh, DDoS and all sort of tricks like this. But normally, uh, there should be a minimum class of QoS which should be guaranteed in each service. Now, the service is always, of course, has, it is, it's never, it cannot never, it can never be a strict observance of one particular characteristics like response time, like uh, uh, megabits, uh, like uh, jitter, and so on. Uh, it's always a statistics. And therefore, you have limits, minimum, maximum. In other words, if the service is in between the minimum and the maximum, it's considered as okay. And that may vary, of course, with time. And sometimes, if you traffic at some, when there is very few users on the net, you'll have better service than if you were trafficking at peak times. Well, I guess that's, that's life, you know. So it can be improved, but it cannot be cured with a 100% guarantee. Thank you. <laughs> It is true that some quality of service could be needed, but it's also true that, sorry, some traffic management uh, could be needed, but it is also true that uh, we should try to, uh, to, to translate it to, the, to a user controlled, uh, maybe traffic management. So a, a, a traffic control instead of then a traffic management operated by uh, a centralized operator. So maybe the, the solution could be also to empower more than the user instead of empowering the ISP, but uh, that opens the, the debate to other, uh, to other uh, um, topics. And so I would like now to, now that we have we had this uh, technical uh, perspective, and we, I would like to ask to Emma to provide us some inputs on why, uh, what makes net, net neutrality also a, a human rights issue. Thank you. Um, so I think a, a key thing in thinking about how net neutrality and, and human rights intersect is to um, think about the, the human right to free expression as enshrined in different human rights instruments. For example, in the university, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, Article 19 states that everyone has a right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. And what you really see in discussions of the human right to free expression is a sense of borderlessness and also of personal choice. Um, I, you know, I, I think there, I don't want to belabor the point of 
how the internet is a kind of revolutionary platform for the enjoyment of, of free expression. I think we're all pretty well versed uh, in the, you know, Frank LaRue, the special rapporteur um, for the United Nations on Freedom of Expression, um, has done a series of reports uh, emphasizing the ways that um, internet access can enable a whole range of human rights, free expression, freedom of assembly and association, access to education, participation in cultural life. Um, I think it's it's fairly uncontroversial to say that uh, you know the the internet is a um, an amazing enabler of free expression, and that's due in part to in in large part to specific characteristics of the internet. Um, the fact that it's global and allows immediate access to information around the world, regardless of frontiers. Um, the fact that it's user controlled. It is this amazing facilitator of user choice, user content selection, um, and putting the power in users' hands to decide what they want to say, how they want to target their information, um, what information they want to access. Uh, it's decentralized with open technical standards and decentralized routing that really lower barriers to entry and make it easy for any person to create a new platform, create a new application, put their views out there into the world. Um, and it's open and competitive. It can accommodate at the endpoints an essentially unlimited number of speakers. Um, and this really helps to create a greater parity between large and small speakers. Uh, and I think the way net neutrality comes into this is net neutrality is really all about preserving these characteristics in the face of increasing technical capacity um, and economic motivation for access providers uh, to to alter them. So also, I think it could be interesting to know what could be the human rights implications of uh, non-neutral uh, traffic management. Mr. Pouzon was uh, arguing that some quality of service could be needed, but uh, that could it, it should be taken into consideration that discriminatory, discriminatory, discriminatory sorry, uh, traffic management could have some consequences on uh, uh, fundamental human rights. So what could be that consequences? Well, I think in addition to the, the sort of obvious censorship consequences of flat out blocking to, to information, um, if you think of something like uh, a content provider and an access provider entering into a paid prioritization deal where um, a large content provider can pay an access provider to get fast lane service on the internet to ensure that their bits get to users um, at a, a high quality of service level. Uh, and if this deal is sort of exclusively offered to certain big content providers, that's really going to um, edge out and squeeze out smaller operators, whether or smaller smaller content providers and smaller speakers, whether they are people in the same country, um, in the same network, or people outside of the country who are trying to decide, you know, do I have to make a deal to actually get my content and my views um, accessible to people in this, uh, using this network, maybe it's not going to be uh, economically feasible to, to try to send my video or send my, um, my service into that country if I know the situation there is that I've got to, to pay to even be able to begin to compete with um, some of the, the dominant players in that country. So I think what we can see with those kinds of deals is the, the potential for creating borders and creating barriers, creating frontiers where um, where there aren't any now. So, so net neutrality is uh, both uh, could be competition law friendly and also human rights uh, friendly. So, uh, could you uh, provide us a couple of inputs on how uh, the investment and competition at the, at the edges uh, can can promote human rights? Right. Well, I think what we've seen with the internet is the um, the ability to support a much greater diversity of media and content sources. Um, so you move away from the more limited uh, broadcast and, and cable environments where you have dominant players with able to put forward huge resources um, to meet the very high barriers to entry um, to access those communication platforms with with the internet, we see much greater opportunity for small, small media companies, individual bloggers, um, to be able to put their own voices out there and, and have that competition with, with the dominant providers um, in a way that, that doesn't require the same kind of investment and the same kind of um, deal making. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. And I, uh, I would like to keep on this uh, human rights uh, path. 
and uh, I would like to ask to Yochai if he uh, could provide uh, provide us some some uh, inputs, his uh, perspective on uh, why it is important now that uh, a net neutrality regulation is adopted. We know that uh, at the European level, the European Commission has proposed a, a, a proposal uh, for a European uh, regulation. And so why it is important that this regulation is adopted and uh, maybe also some comments on uh, what could be uh, a, a good direction to follow to, a, to adopt a good regulation. Thanks, Luca. <clears throat> My name is Yochai Benavi. I'm the policy director at Access. Access Network. We're an international NGO that defends and extends the rights of users at risk around the world. Um, I think Chris did a really great job of sort of highlighting how net neutrality is something that's happening around the world right now. Um, some ways, you know, running ahead and some ways under threat. Um, and, and I think what, one of the things that this highlights is net neutrality means different things to different people and different governments. Um, and so I think that, you know, we, perhaps some of those of us who are familiar with Nelly Cruz, the, the European Commissioner for the Digital Agenda, um, has proposed recently a single telecom market regulation. She says it will guarantee net neutrality, innovation, and consumer rights, but it still allows for discriminatory practices. Um, so again, Article 23 says, quote, blocks, um, prohibits ISPs to block, slow down, degrade, or otherwise discriminate against specific services, content, or applications, but then makes these provisions meaningless by allowing for a sort of preferential, commercial preferential agreements um, with content providers. I mean, simply put, if there's a, a fast lane and a slow lane, there's discrimination. Um, and the notion that if ISPs are transparent about their restrictive practices, then discrimination is, you know, acceptable, is ludicrous. Um, a transparent wrong is still a wrong. Um, and, and as Chris sort of pointed to, the notion that, you know, this will allow, you know, users to make informed choices like to switch, I think, fails to take into account the nature of the European telecom market, indeed, most telecom markets around the world. Um, I think the way that the, we like to approach this and, and the way we do in the paper that's included in the Dynam Coalition's report is around the, the language of net discrimination. Um, this is the tendency of ISPs to intentionally and arbitrarily apply restrictions to users' access to the open neutral internet. Um, and generally speaking, this, this can take place in the following four ways, through blocking of application and services, slowing or throttling internet speeds, blocking websites, and preferential treatment of services and platforms. Um, I've heard a lot about you know, reasonable traffic management, right? This is how these discriminatory practices are often justified by ISPs. And I think that there's a fine line between preventing saturation um, by slowing down or throttling certain streams and degrading the quality of competing services um, or violating users' rights to seek, receive, and impart information. Um, and so in our paper, we try to sort of talk about what, what do reasonable, you know, traffic management purposes actually look like? Um, and I think traffic management is reasonable when it's deployed for the purposes of technical maintenance of the network. Um, so that's namely to box spam, um, to deal with viruses, denial of service attacks, or to minimize the effects of congestion, um, whereby equal tra types of traffic should be treated equally. Um, and this is established in the Dutch net neutrality law. Um, traffic management techniques should only be used on a temporary basis during exceptional moments. Um, when traffic management practices are put in place to pursue other purposes, or used on a permanent basis, they should be considered unreasonable. Um, furthermore, discriminatory practices such as blocking and throttling competing services should be clearly prohibited by law as they threaten citizens' fundamental rights um, and undermine the proper functioning of the online marketplace. Um, but I think that traffic management also raises another human rights concern, um, in addition to sort of access to information, um, the, the freedom to seek, receive, and impart information. The increasing use of perpetual and unjustified traffic management also raises questions about the privacy of communications. Um, in order to implement a variety of traffic management practices, such as blocking, shaping, filtering, et cetera, um, these ISPs are deploying tools such as deep packet inspection technology. Um, and this allows them to examine the data traveling over the internet and recognize what kind of packet it is. And that's important, right, to stop you know, spam and malware and so forth um, and mitigate attacks on the network. But this technology can also be deployed for reasons that fall far outside the scope of securing the network. Um, indeed, this highly intrusive tool can be used not only to implement discriminatory practices, but also to monitor and indeed copy all information that flows over the network, um, which I think we have heard um, quite a bit about <laughs> over the last few months. Um, 
again, by, by inspecting communications data, I mean ISVs breach, you know, and this, this is a violation of, um, we would argue, of Article 8 of the European Convention uh, for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, Article 7 and 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Um, and so in line with the, the opinion of the European Data Protection Supervisor, um, you know, we would say these filtering techniques may only be used in conformity with the applicable data protection and privacy safeguards, which lay down limits as to what can be done under what circumstances. Um, in his preface to our paper, um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the, the founder of the World Wide Web, argues, quote, some are concerned that mandating net neutrality through regulation would impose regulation for the interest that could inhibit broadband deployment. One vision is that the industry and government alike can indeed maintain net neutrality on a voluntary basis. However, recent events insist that to trust present and future governments and industries to that extent with something so crucial, something whose abuse provides such power, is naive. Yes, regulation to keep the, open, the internet open is still regulation, and generally the internet thrives on a lack of regulation. But the core freedom of speech and the rules against discrimination based on race, gender, skin color, and religion are indeed enshrined in law in developed countries to great benefit and acclaim. Why not net neutrality? Just as democracy depends on legislative freedom of speech, so freedom to connect with any application to any party is the fundamental social basis of the internet, and now the society based on it. History has shown that in the absence of regulation, many companies will discriminate, particularly if there's profit to be made. Europe has long been an international policy standard setter, um, especially on issues concerning human rights, and network neutrality should be no new exception. Um, strong legislation will only provide European citizens with the right to access an unfettered internet, um, free from discrimination, but could also set an important global standard um, benefiting users internationally. Um, and so to realize and protect the full potential of the internet and to enable and promote the flourishing of human rights, um, we believe that Europe needs strong, comprehensive net neutrality legislation now. Thanks a lot, Rio Hai, also for highlighting that uh, traffic management, traffic discrimination uh, could could be allowed from some means for some uh, uh, integrity and security uh, reasons. So to pr to preserve the integrity and security of the network on a temporary basis. So what is the problem is to deploy such measures on a permanent basis, and to also to deploy intrusive measures as we have seen the packet inspection is. Um, so uh, I think it could be also interesting to analyze some of the social uh, aspects of net neutrality. So I would like to uh, ask to Francesca to uh, hi highlight why it is important to, uh, to study net neutrality from a public, sorry, a public sphere perspective. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luca, for uh, the invitation and uh, delighted to be to be here and to be part of this um, uh, this book project. Uh, so, um, the, what I'm about to say in the next few minutes is like the result of joint work with a, a German colleague, Maria Lobley, who could not be uh, here to, uh, today. And uh, um, what we've done is that we, we have tried to approach the net neutrality topic from the perspective uh, of a uh, um, public sphere uh, literature and, uh, and studies. So why is that? Because uh, regardless of the ways in which net neutrality is defined, and as uh, um, a few speakers have already pointed out, it can mean different things to, to different people. It has to do, it, it is at the very core of the question of uh, whether distribution channels can be used as a means to, to discriminate, to, to control, and to prevent communication in some way. So in other way, content and, and user behavior can be controlled to, through the architecture of the physical layer, layer and the code layer of the internet. Um, so the discussion on net neutrality actually touches a number of uh, fundamental values that range from uh, public interest to freedom of expression, freedom of the media, uh, and the free flow uh, of information. And, and Communication policy authority, uh, authorities sorry, actually frequently appeal to uh, all of these, uh, um, these values in order to uh, legitimize their interventions in, in media systems. Uh, and uh, the implementation of these values from a normative point of view is seen as the precondition for uh, media to create the public sphere, uh, whether it's online uh, or offline, and thus fulfill its function in society. So, uh, of course, the uh, concept of public sphere is, uh, has been uh, elaborated in many different ways by different authors. Um, 
However, the, the concept developed by uh, Jürgen uh, Habermas is widely recognized as being the most uh, influential in this respect. And uh, according to him, uh, the, the public sphere links uh, citizens and power holders in a realm of our social life in which something approaching public opinion uh, can be formed. And so his concept on public sphere pays, um, um, gives a lot of importance to deliberation and uh, uh, posits that functioning deliberation uh, requires that access is guaranteed uh, to all citizens. So, of course, you see me coming that this emphasis uh, on access makes the concept of the public sphere um, particularly useful for uh, the investigation of the, of the net neutrality debates. Uh, and... Uh, um, so we, we particularly used um, Peter Dahlgren um, uh, concept of, uh, of the public sphere because he developed it into an analytical tool to study uh, the role of uh, the media and the internet more specifically vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the public sphere. Uh, so he distinguishes uh, three uh, analytical dimensions of the public sphere, the structural, the representational, and uh, the interactional. Uh, the first refers to the organization of, communi of communicative spaces uh, in terms of uh, legal, social, economic, and uh, even uh, web architectural features. And uh, all of these patterns uh, impact internet access in different ways. Uh, the representational dimension uh, directs attention more to the media output and raises questions that concern uh, fairness, uh, pluralism uh, of views, agenda setting, uh, ideological biases, uh, and other uh, evaluation criteria for, for media content. And uh, uh, finally, the, the third dimension, the interactional one, focuses on the way in, uh, where users uh, interact with the media and uh, with each other, in particular online sites and, and, and spaces. So we, we have been using these analytical dimensions as a, a heuristic framework uh, to identify net neutrality areas that are relevant for communication studies and use them as an entry point into a particular set of uh, net neutrality issues. So uh, the structural dimension has been a way to uh, address uh, the bundle of net neutrality issues that are related to access uh, to the internet infrastructures, both for individual and collective uh, uh, entities. Uh, the representational dimension uh, has led to the question of uh, how net neutrality relates to online content and its distribution. And uh, um, uh, the, the related issues are, of course, content diversity, control, and censorship. And finally, the interactional dimension uh, has been used to direct attention to uh, the modes, cultures, and spaces of social communication online and whether they are affected by net neutrality. So we have particularly been focused on closed systems or uh, walled gardens to illustrate the extent to which potential benefits for online interaction and deliberation can be impeded or, or lost. So, uh, of course, there is some overlapping between these dimensions, but... Uh, um, we, we hope that it's, uh, it provides a uh, communication studies uh, informed perspective on, uh, on these debates, and uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to get any questions on uh, like how we address this in more detail in uh, the chapter, which starts around page 36, 35, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wonderful. So thanks a lot for this uh, explanation, and I would like to check if there are any questions in the, in the room before uh, attacking the, the, the model framework. So, I think Eduardo, and then the gentleman there, and then another question there. Eduardo. Uh, can we bring a, mic a microphone there, please? Okay, thank you, and thank you for wonderful presentations, very useful for for me. Uh, first, uh, well, I'm Eduardo Bertoni. I'm the director of the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at Palermo University in Argentina. I'm also a law professor. I'm teaching human rights and the internet, and one of my classes is on net neutrality. So the link between net neutrality and human rights is something that I have been working. And just an announcement, the our center just launched yesterday a paper in Spanish, a policy paper in Spanish on net neutrality with some recommendations because in Latin America, as you I say, uh, this is an issue and many countries are start after Chile's law, are start thinking in having uh, a regulation. We also translated into Spanish the framework. So it is in the website, uh, uh, in our website and the website of of the coalition. We think that it's a very, very useful starting point for, for, for discussions. 
my questions. Um, I agree with you, Hyde, that uh, net neutrality has different means for different governments. It's, uh, sometimes it's a misleading, you know, or, or people put net neutrality under a misleading spotlight, and they talk about net neutrality, but they are not really talking about net neutrality. But my questions are more, are, 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 I think, are, are specific on three issues. One is related to traffic control or traffic management, which we agree that it's necessary at some point, should not be discriminatory, but it's necessary. But my question is, who should control the non-discrimination of, of, of traffic management? And I think we found that it's very uh, a, a complicated answer. Because yes, the, the easier answer, or the easy answer is to say, well, the telecommunications offices in the, in, in, in the government, or some of those offices should be controlling, should be the ones that control this. this. But sometimes they don't have the capacity to do so. So my my my, my question is: Is it better to have a, you know, some sort of control, policing control, uh, random control, or some kind of reactive control? Somebody somebody make a denounce or something, and then the the agency can start working. My second question is about the establishment in the rules of the net neutrality principle. What do you think? Is it better to have a law, a formal law, that establish net neutrality, or it is enough with executive orders or implementing decrees that implement telecommunication laws? This is something we are experiencing. In Argentina, for example, in one track, the Senate is discussing a net neutrality law. On the other track, the, the, the president issued an executive decree that implement one telecommunication law that included net, net neutrality. We are in favor of a law, but I want to, to hear your reaction. And my final question is about, again, traffic management. And I asked who, and now I ask how. When we ask how, again, going back to Yohai, DPI is the issue, but DPI could be very dangerous. So what's the limit there to, for the, for, 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 for controlling the, the, the traffic. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eduardo, for these uh, interesting questions. Uh, who would like to have the honor? Okay, the, okay. First, first the father of the internet. <laughs> I'm not sure I understood the second one. <laughs> uh, for the first question, I think it's a, it's a, real, it's a real important question. Who control, indeed? Um, first, uh, I think the networks must be must be um, transparent. In other words, the characteristics of the net have to be transparent. That can be a, a regulation, actually. It can be put into law or some kind of a coercing uh, institution. Second thing, it has to be measured. With a QoS, you cannot measure. It has absolutely no meaning. And therefore, there should be instruments which uh, um, verify that the end-to-end -end characteristics defined in the QoS are indeed met by the service. Now, if it's not met, what happened? Well, uh, indeed, that's becoming a little bit more difficult. But usually, uh, when it o always occurs in, s in some end-to-end uh, -end terminations, it usually points after some uh, some statistics, you can point to a particular area in the net where the trouble occurs. Now, it, has, it certainly is, is a specialized job. I think the agencies, in usually in a in country where you have telecom uh, operate, several telecom operators, you have a sort of a state uh, control agency which is supposed to be independent and which uh, typically make measurements on to the characteristics of the service. That should be its role, I believe. The second thing, I think, is operator should be required to provide their own statistics on their own traffic. Of course, they can lie, but you cannot lie constantly because they have also competitors, and competitors observe what's happening, and if they uh, would lie consistently, they certainly would be caught quite quickly. The third thing is the user should be able to determine uh, whether uh, the QoS he pays for is actually met. And this is possible. Well, today we have various tools which most people ignore, 
which, for example, can measure the bandwidth, can measure the bandwidth you actually receive, or can measure the number of packets, or can measure the jitter of the uh, signal if you're, for example, using a voice communication. Uh, this uh, usually requires some special software which people can acquire or which can be given to them, or it may require some external box which make measurements out of the net because it may require end-to-end -end, uh, acknowledgement of signals. But it may not be uh, simple for anybody to do, but it certainly is very possible to do for uh, advanced users or for uh, technicians who are assisting users. So I guess unless you have you know, a, a, a certain gamut of tools for measuring uh, the traffic, measuring the characteristics, indeed, uh, QoS doesn't mean much. Thanks and so. in which case, there is no point in, uh, a claim in uh, say, um, complaining about distortion, because if you get the QoS you pay for, uh, who cares about what other services, what other users are doing? It's their business. It's it up to each user to complain if uh, the service he gets is not correct, like anybody, uh, the relation people have today with uh, their providers uh, in any case, you know, it's con accountants, uh, uh, traffic, uh, airline traffic, and so on. They can complain if they don't have the good service. That's it. Thank, th thanks a lot for this uh, answer. Also, it is also true that these, uh, there are tools that exist, but they are frequently not uh, understandable for the average user. For, so a technician can easily complain, but maybe an average user, user will not be able to understand that he is throttled or discriminated. So I think Chris also wanted to provide it. So it, uh, I must say, first of course, it's a great honor to be on a panel with Professor Cousin. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to hear from uh, uh, one of the, well, the father of Cyclades and one of the fathers of the internet, of course. I just want to say a couple of things about this. Uh, the first um, is that one has to set down certain rules to tell the telcos what they can't be doing. And I was really delighted to hear Professor Poussin say that, of course, one of the problems is telcos are not, we should not assume their honesty, uh, but we should put in place tools that allow us to demonstrate if they're not being honest, particularly by using their competitors' analysis of these things and, of course, advanced users use the geeks to catch them out when they're, when they're doing the wrong thing. Um, I think you're quite right. A formal law is necessary in order to establish very clearly the, uh, uh, the baseline from which telecom operators have to, uh, have to actually uh, carry out these tasks. Um, as I say, in, in many European countries, we've tried all manner of non-legislative means of being suggestive, but in actual fact, they seem to be sending the wrong signals rather than the right signals to the, regula uh, to the regulators and the operators. Um, and the third thing is I think we mustn't be scared of deep packet inspection. Uh, it needs regulating. We need to make sure that it's controlled the way that it's used. But most fixed operators and almost all mobile operators use deep packet inspection. So I think it's foolish to start having a, a discussion about whether or not it should be introduced. That is too late. We're five years past the debate about whether or not it should be introduced. It, it has been introduced, whether we, whether we like it or not. It has been introduced. Um, I just want to make one comment also. Uh, the European Council conclusions uh, on the uh, telecom package, which of course includes the discussion of, uh, uh, of net neutrality, says that they welcome the presentation of the package and encourage the legislator to carry out an intensive examination with a view to its timely adoption, which I think means it's been killed in the current session, as I understand, because its timely adoption doesn't suggest any urgency. I don't know if that's the case or not. I'm, I'm less skilled at reading council uh, conclusions than, uh, than some people in the room. And just one final point, which is that this issue about quality of service, of course we must allow quality of service to be introduced. It's being introduced typically through what's now called specialized services. I didn't get time to talk about specialized services in my presentation, but clearly the definition of specialized services is going to be extremely important in terms of what is the open internet, what is uh, specialized services with guaranteed quality of service. And this is something which will, uh, I think, be a really growing topic as we go forward. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> I think there is another reply by Yochai, and then uh, I would keep the question for after the model framework, because otherwise we will not have any time to analyze the model framework. Sorry. 
Well, it's, it's because Eduardo asked such great questions. Um, I'll try and keep it short and pithy. Um, I think that we are perhaps entering a golden age of, of measurement of the network. Um, and in terms of making those measurements accessible and understandable um, and usable by average users. And I think that's a real sort of game changer in a way to this question of um, sort of compliance and enforcement. Um, and so I think who should control the traffic is management is, is probably the national regulatory authorities on the telecom side. But I think that looking at you know DPI usage and so forth and the privacy concerns here, I think that data protection authorities and other sort of national human rights institutions do have a role um, to play here as well. Um, I think that we, as Chris touched on, I mean, I think that we've seen around the world that anything short of hard law fails to actually compel changes in behavior. And even when we do have hard law, a lack of enforcement has failed to change corporate behavior. Um, and so, you know, we need regulators, we need hard law to empower the regulators, and we need those regulators to have enforcement power. So if you look at some of the co-regulatory approaches, like, for example, in Norway, they just, they don't have the capacity to pass sanctions um, for violation. And so that's, I think, why we push very hard for hard law. Um, again, Chris, just to clarify, I wasn't saying that DPI shouldn't be used. I think DPI is, is critical to, to maintain network security. Um, here, too, I think that we need to have oversight um, and transparency and audits by the data protection authorities um, to ensure that there aren't abuses on the network. Um, and I think that, just to finalize, finish up, I mean, I think, going back to my first point about, about measurement, we can see through network graphs, right, when traffic management is, you know, here's this occasional disruption, we're having some congestion, and it happens a little bit, you know, variance, and we sort of th throttle things a little bit just to make sure everything keeps going, versus every night at 6 p.m., traffic just kind of drops, or, um, you know, this protocol is banned entirely at all points. And we, the, really the granularity of measurement and the accessibility and, and sort of intuitive, intuitivity of measurement is getting much better, and I think that will really empower both users and regulators. Sorry, hi. Um, so uh, I would like now to start to analyze a little bit the model framework. Um, could we <coughs> project the model framework on the screen? Uh, and also, if you want, you can also have a copy of the report of the Dynamic Coalition at the, uh, at the bottom of the room. So if you can directly read it on paper, if you like reading on paper. If you don't like reading on paper, you can also check the model framework on netoneutrality.info. It's uh, on CC by uh, license, so you can find it. Uh, and uh, so if, if, you, if you're searching for it in the, in the report, it's at page uh, 103. So I would just like to introduce a little bit this model framework. Uh, as I was, uh, as I was, I was stating, sorry, before um, the process of the model framework has been uh, stimulated and initiated by the Council of Europe with the 2010 declaration. Uh, the internal governance strategy of the Council of Europe uh, explicitly foresees the elaboration of human rights principle to protect. Uh, uh, net neutrality and the, the 2010 declaration suggested the elaboration of a framework to provide guidance to uh, Council of Europe member in order to uh, protect uh, net neutrality. Uh, as it has been highlighted clearly, the, net, the internet is a collection of uh, thousands of autonomous systems, and these autonomous systems uh, are interoperable and compatible because they use the same standards that are produced through an open and uh, participatory process and transparent process. So the, the purpose of the dynamic coalition was to be uh, instrumental in elaborating this model framework in, a, in the same way of, uh, of the standard policy make, the, sorry, the standard elaboration process of the ITF, so an open, inclusive, transparent process. So we have tried to transpose the ITF standard elaboration process to policy making. And we have tried to do so to have a specific model that can provide guidance on how to, impl to protect human, uh, sorry, net neutrality in accordance with human rights, because specific standards are what allow, allow 
a lot of uh, autonomous system to be interoperable and form the internet. So this mod, the purpose of this, of this model, model is to allow a lot of autonomous, sorry, let's say independent uh, national legal system to be interoperable and to protect network neutrality in an efficient fashion. Uh, the first step uh, was to define what is network neutrality and what are the limits of network neutrality. So uh, as we were hearing before, several people have different conception of what is network neutrality. So we have defined a principle of network neutrality which is the principle according to which internet traffic shall be treated equally without discrimination, restriction, or interference, regardless of its sender or recipient or type or content, so that internet users' freedom of choice is not restricted by favoring or disfavoring the transmission of internet traffic associated with particular content, services, applications, or devices. So uh, what is important is the non-discrimination uh, um, features of this principle that do not allow to target specific uh, type of content uh, of uh, services of applications or to uh, block according to the recipient or, sen or, or, or the, or the uh, sender however there are there are limits to to uh, this principle because as freedom of expression it is not an absolute right there are these limits there are some limits and some responsibilities. The net neutrality principle has some uh, limits and uh, entails some responsibility. So in Article 2, in accordance with the net neutrality principle, internet service providers shall refrain from discriminating, restricting, or otherwise interfering with the transmission of internet traffic unless such interference is strictly necessary and proportionate to give effect to a legislative provision. So legislative provision can be an exception to uh, uh, non-discrimination, for instance, blocking some uh, kind of uh, uh, um, some kind of uh, content that is against national uh, legislation. Preserve the integrity and security of the network. We have seen that uh, that is something essential. It is an essential exception. Uh, for instance, in cases of uh, distributed denial of service attack, or uh, to prevent the, the, the circulation of malware. Prevent the transmission of unsolicited communication for directing uh, marketing purposes. So that is the case uh, to uh, allow the ISP to prevent the circulation of spam when uh, the, the um, end users uh, give, give the, their prior consent. Comply with an explicit request from the subscribers, and that is the case in which a subscriber it himself wants the ISP to block some content, for instance, for, to, pro, to, to receive Christian internet or uh, to uh, receive child-friendly internet, but that is the case in which it is the subscriber that being the subscribers, so paying for the internet, he wants to have a specific kind of internet and to mitigate the effect of temporary and exceptional network congestion primarily by means of application agnostic measures, so measures that do not target uh, specific content applications or services, and when these measures do not prove efficient, by means of application-specific measures. So if application agnostic measures are not uh, efficient, application-specific measures could be, uh, could be used. Also, Article 3, the network neutrality principle shall apply to all internet access service and internet transit service offered by ISPs. We have seen that discrimination can uh, take place not, o not only at the last mile, but also at the interconnection level. So it is, if we want to truly protect network neutrality, all ISPs should, be, uh, should uh, convey traffic in a non-discriminatory fashion. The network neutrality principle need not to, ap to apply to specialized services. This is in <clears throat> an important uh, exception that allows the provision of services according to a specific quality of service. Uh, but these um <clears throat> sorry, specialized services uh, are defined. I would li just like to draw your attention the, on the definition of specialized services. If you go to Article 9, uh, 9 uh, indent F, the expression specialized services refers to electronic communication services that are provided and operated within closed electronic communications network 
using the internet protocol, but not being part of the internet. I've, I really uh, hope that uh, the, college, the European co legislators, when they will uh, review the European Commission proposal, will consider this definition, because it is essential to preserve the open and best effort internet that, quite, that specialized services be kept as something separate that do not that is provided in cl in closed network and do not interfere with uh, the open and best effort internet if we want to preserve the open and best effort internet and to coming back to article 4 uh, internet service providers should be allowed to offer specialized services in addition to internet access service provided that such offering are not to the detriment of internet access service or their performance, affordability, or quality. So specialized services should be encouraged. That is an exception to network neutrality. It has to be encouraged because it can foster creativity, innovation, but the provision of specialized services should not uh, diminish the performance, affordability, or quality of the open internet. And offerings to delivering specialized services should be provided on a non-discriminatory basis and their adoption by internet users should be voluntary. So users should not be obliged to, uh, to adopt specialized services. Article 5, subscribers of internet access service have the right to receive and use a public and globally unique internet address. So that is, uh, that could, can, this provision can sound odd for uh, someone that is not uh, a technician, that is, does not have a technical background, but uh, we, uh, this uh, provision specifically target the use of uh, carrier-grade uh, um, NATS, the network address translation, uh, that ex basically exploits a unique uh, public uh, address, a unique IP address, and then uh, provide uh, thousands of sub-addresses but this, uh, this uh, carrier grade net have presented several problems for uh, uh, users. So they do not allow users to enjoy services uh, like uh, voice over IP or uh, online gaming or less. Uh, I will rephrase. They, it is not that they do not allow, but they present a lot of technical problems. So the, the issue is if you are a subscriber, if you are paying for your subscription, you should be f free to use all the services you want, all the legal services you want. And it, is not, it d does not have to be up to the, uh, to the telecom operator to tell you you cannot use that. If you are a regular internet user that, for instance, has, has, is enjoying free access to the internet in a library or in a cafe, m in that case, you maybe could be accessed through, through net, through uh, carrier grade net. But if you are paying for uh, your internet connection, you have the right to have a publicly unique uh, internet access, uh, internet uh, address, sorry. Any techniques to inspect or analyze internet traffic shall be in accordance with privacy and data protection legislation. This recalls the um, European data protection, uh, um, uh, sorry, the European uh, um, that protection super, um, supervisor uh, opinion that was stating that uh, in 2012 was sta 2011 sorry was uh, stating that uh, technique intrusive te techniques should be uh, granted in accordance to both privacy and uh, data protection legislation so that is extremely important and also we, we stated by default such technique should only examine header information. So not the content of the of the packets that are delivered, because analyzing the content of the packet is like a postman that opens a, a letter and sees what is inside and then decide how to deliver it. That is a violation of the privacy of electronic communications. So, uh, if that is put in place, that has to be scrutinized by the, the the national data protection authority. So, the use of any technique which inspect or analyze the content of communications should be reviewed by the relevant National Data Protection Authority to assess compliance with the applicable privacy and data protection obligations. So uh, intrusive techniques may be used as long as their use and implementation is reviewed 
by the National Data Protection Authority. Article 7, internet service providers shall uh, provide intelligible and transparent information with regard to their traffic management practices and usage policy, notably with regard to the coexistence of internet access service and specialized services. <coughs> Sorry. We've seen that transparency is of utmost, of utmost importance, but we know that simply providing information that are not intelligible, that cannot be understood by uh, the regular users, equals to not providing information. The information that explains how uh, uh, traffic management is adopted and which kind of traffic management is adopted should be intelligible, should, should be meaningful, should be understandable by the users. And especially uh, the information regarding the existence of specialized services and public internet should be clearly stated because we have seen that specialized services are encouraged, are allowed, but they do not have to diminish the quality, affordability, uh, and performance of the open internet. When network capacity is shared between internet access service and specialized services, the criteria whereby network capacity is shared shall be clearly stated, as I was mentioning. Article 8 is the uh, enforcement mechanism of this model. The competent national regulatory authority shall be mandated to regularly monitor and report on internet traffic management practices and usage policies in order to ensure network neutrality, evaluate the potential impact of the af aforementioned practices on, and policies on fundamental rights, ensure the provision of a sufficient quality of service and the allocation of a satisfac satisfactory level of network capacity to the internet. Reporting should be done in an open and transparent fashion and reports shall be made freely available to the public. So the question who should uh, monitor and how? Well, this is the answer. It is the national regulator that should monitor how traffic management is implemented, which kind of traffic management is implemented, and to also to monitor that these uh, traffic management policies, uh, which kind of impact these policies have on natural neutrality and on human rights. So it is not, as we know, uh, it is not particularly difficult to uh, train s some uh, officials that work for, na for national authority in human rights, in fundamental rights, to extend their competence. It, it just has to be clearly stated and clearly defined how to do it. And mm, also, uh, recalling an anecdote of a uh, South American regulator that uh, was sitting on thousands of, of uh, complaints on natural neutrality without taking any step, we have clearly stated that uh, reporting should be done in an open, transparent fashion, and the reports shall be made freely available to the public, so the public can know which kind of report uh, ha has, has been done, and put in place, the, the regulator should put in place appropriate, clear, open, and efficient procedures aimed at addressing natural neutrality complaints. <clears throat> Sorry, and to this end, all internet users shall be entitled to make use of such complaints procedure in front of a relevant authority, and respond, and the authority should respond to the complaints within a reasonable time and be able to use necessary measure in order to sanction the breach of network neutrality principle. So all end users should have a right to file a complaint. Because as Monsieur Poussin was saying, users can have the power, the, the tools to identify discrimination. And they have the right to signal this discrimination and to file a complaint. And as I was saying before, recalling the anecdote of the uh, regulator that was sitting on thousands of, of, of uh, uh, complaints without acting, the regulator should respond to the complaint within a, a reasonable uh, and, uh, time and be able to use necessary measures in order to sanction the breach of net neutrality principle. And then, finally, the authority must have the necessary resources to undertake the aforementioned duties. So the authority, if we want them to be effective, to receive the complaint, to act, to monitor, they have to be resources. We cannot pretend that an authority does this uh, overwhelming uh, job without having resources. Now, here we state how it should be done the uh, national government should affect the uh, necessary resources to do this work. There are 
mm, also definitions at uh, artic in Article 9, but as we are running out uh, of time, I hope you will understand that we have uh, started with uh, five or seven minutes of delay, so if we exceed a little bit the time, maybe you will be uh, comprehensible and, and you will understand. Uh, I would like to open the, the, the floor for, um, for comments and questions. So I think there is a gentleman there. Could we bring him and then Anna? Thank you. Um, Mike Jensen, <coughs> excuse me, from the Association of Progressive Communications, APC. Uh, I was just wondering if um, the framework might be made even more effective uh, by broadening the scope beyond um, the technicalities and mechanics of internet traffic management to consider one of the key issues that sort of has been alluded to but I don't think has been really focused on, which is the relationship between the network operator and the content provider a commercial relationship. And by this I mean everything from we hear about network operators who are pressuring content providers to pay them for the delivery of traffic to the sort of fast lane uh, concept, which is probably the most well-known aspect of, of this relationship. And then also even to an area which kind of falls outside of this, but I think is particularly important for developing countries, which is a trend we see where... Um, content providers are forging special relationships with, uh, say, particularly the mobile providers and other providers which charge on the basis of bytes. So now, for example, Facebook is freely available on many mobile phone uh, networks in Africa. Um, so they are able to access, quotes, the Internet, but all they're really looking at is Facebook because they can't afford to look at anything else. Uh, so that is my one question. The other question is on the... Um, efficacy of actually in, um, re relying on the regulator to be able to enforce. Um, my particular concern relates to a recent case where uh, Verizon took the American regulator to court and basically said, you have no jurisdiction above what I do with my network. Those are my two questions. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, is, is there uh, someone that, wants, that has an immediate reply? Or? Uh, I, I think that in terms of the details, H should respond to, to some of the concerns about the content provider's relationship with the ISP. And I, I think that we should bear in mind that the content provider is quite often actually, in terms of the large commercial content providers, is pressing for an exclusive relationship with the ISP so that, of course, these problems can go both ways. It's not... It's not nasty ISPs ganging up on content providers. It can go the other way as well. Uh, and so we really need to be aware of that, particularly when it comes to specialized services. I actually have a comment myself, uh, which is that, and Luca knows this, I was uh, worried about the way that the wording uh, exists in, in part four on specialized services. Uh, because I particularly think that to talk about specialized services not being to the detriment of the open internet is not strong enough. I think that there's a zero-sum game sometimes being played in terms of investment, and if one is investing in, in specialized services, that can be to the expense of open internet services, and that might be to the, to the expense of open internet services in terms of increasing speed. In other words, I know there was a big debate in Germany about the fact that Deutsche Telekom was talking about capping users initially at 384 kilobits per second and then 2 megabits per second over a period of years. And you saw from the UK graph that the, the, the speed of increase of internet services has been actually quite impressive over years. So I think that if people are investing in, in specialized services, they should also have a requirement to invest in the continued improvement of open internet services. Otherwise, we get this dirt road problem you were talking about. So I haven't even answered your question properly, but I just wanted to make that point. So forgive me for abusing process. Thank you, Chris, for your uh, answer. Uh, does someone else in the panel want to reply? Uh, you, you, no. um, just on your on your first point to say that I um, I completely agree. These questions of of pricing and what kinds of commercial relationships content providers are entering into, especially with mobile networks, I think is a key topic that we should all be thinking about more clearly. These the the concept of zero rating services um, and not counting access to certain online services toward data caps on mobile devices. We're seeing it from 
um, major companies like Facebook and Google, and Wikipedia has a, a practice like this as well. And so I think there's going to be some really um, difficult discussions over, you know, when do when a potential, what might seem like a net neutrality violation is being done in the service of greater access to information, uh, you know, what's the right response there? And I think that would be a really interesting conversation um, to keep moving with. And then on your, your point about uh, Verizon's challenge to the, the open internet order in the United States, I think this kind of picks up on um, what Eduardo was asking and, and Yohai's comments about the need for um, really strong uh, legal framework supporting net neutrality regulation um, because, you know, the fight in the U.S. is all about does the Communications Commission have the authority to treat Verizon um, essentially under a, a common carriage rule, uh, and that's something that they're pushing back against. But I'd also highlight that Verizon is further challenging the order um, and the concept of a non-discrimination requirement as a violation of its own First Amendment free expression rights. Um, and so I think that even, you know, regardless of what legal framework we have around net neutrality, we're going to see um, the ISPs, or at least some of the networks, pushing back on essentially every front they can and arguing that, you know, they're, uh, as Verizon's been arguing, they are like a, a newspaper editor. They have the right to decide for their users what kind of content they get. So I think we're going to see um, a whole range of, of arguments brought up by the network operators against non discrimination principles. I agree with everything Emma said, but uh, but I would add that that just to riff off something Mike said, it might be beneficial to put something into the model framework around sending party pays, or rather against sending party pays, and trying to ward against that because I think that's something that we're seeing pop up, particularly from at now in in a variety of fora, um, and that to the point of sort of whether regulators have. Um, you know, the actual power to enforce and so forth, I think adding an explicit point on remedy uh, into Section 8 might be useful as well um, under the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Um, corporations do have a responsibility, as well as governments, of course, to um, provide effective access to remedy and sort of creating that action um, and that right of action might be um, quite useful. First, uh, the question is whether this, you know, this little booklet is wonderful. The, the organizers of this uh, meeting has been uh, fantastic in putting up in a beautiful book, you know, all the articles. Are they going to be online? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Okay. And just for the French-speaking people, uh, we have put the French version of uh, my article on uh, open-root.eu. Wonderful, but obviously you can, as I stated at the very beginning, you can find a paper copy there. Uh, if you don't like to, to, to read paper or if you want to share the, the report with the rest of the world, the report is on at netneutrality.info. You will find it in the sources uh, pages, or no, in the events pages, when, in, when, when, where the, the description of this uh, event is, is shown. And you can share it with the rest of the world because it is on Creative Commons license. So we'll get, so is on, uh, and the model has also been tra translated in in uh, in Spanish, thanks to uh, Eduardo, and uh, and uh, it will be also translated in French because another report with the model, uh, a more detailed report, will be communicated is has already been communicated but has still to be translated to the Council of Europe to so that the model could be considered and. Uh, uh, hopefully, maybe uh, recommended by the Council of Europe, because I would like to remind that this, uh, the, the Dynamic Coalition has been instrumental to develop this model and this report in an open, uh, transparent, collaborative fashion, but the, the whole process has started thanks to the Council of Europe and will keep on at the Council of Europe. Other questions? Yes, there? Ooh, ooh. Okay. I hope you will, uh, you will uh, be uh, merciful and stay five minutes more, <laughs> please. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is uh, Erno Storm. I come from the Norwegian Telecom Regulator. Uh, just, uh, I think that uh, it's a very good work that you have done and uh, to put together this model framework for network neutrality, which can be used on a global uh, scope, so that's very good. I think that's very good guidance to actually implement and ensure the network neutrality. Just, uh, just an observation, a comment uh, connected to uh, the proposed uh, regulation in the European uh, setting, then of course from the Norwegian side we would very much like to continue the co-regulation 
on network neutrality in Norway because that works in Norway. But of course, we are mindful that we are part of the larger community and of course the European internal market. Uh, and of course, we also, uh, because of the EEA agreement, we also have to sort of uh, implement the regulation in Norway as well when it's passed through the European Parliament and Council. So, so, um, but of course, we also agree with what uh, Chris mentioned, uh, also that the specialized services needs to be specified so, so that you can allow that to sort of not to influence and to ensure the proper network neutrality. Uh, just a short uh, observation as well. It's very interesting also, I think, not in this room, but... Uh, in the past, at least, uh, many from civil society, technical community, uh, academia have so, sort of been very much against and have problems seeing the government role in internet governance and internet regulation. And of course, now we have strong sort of uh, wanting to have hard law regulation on the internet. So that's interesting as an observation. And of course, that this is very clear that the government do have a role in the different aspects of internet governance. So I think the, uh, this is a very good example of sort of identifying the different roles of the different stakeholders in the internet governance framework. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for also for highlighting that governments have, have a fundamental role, to, especially in protecting rights and should be the first uh, starting process and involving other stakeholders to have efficient process. Um, I think, uh, Anna sorry, Anna, Anna was waiting, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I'll try to be short. Um, so some comments. Uh, Chris mentioned how, uh, and actually uh, Puzin also did, uh, how establishing a minimum, how you can, you need to watch out for uh, how it balances when you introduce specialized services so that how, how the other lane, sort of, so to call it, balances so that there's not a dead road. And um, I wanted to note that both the Dutch and the Slovenian uh, law and also the European Commission, they uh, consider the possibility of uh, allowing uh, a telecom authority, a regulating, uh, sorry, a regulating authority to establish a minimum uh, service uh, uh, to, to be guaranteed. So uh, I was wondering, you know, just a reflection, maybe there's not time for further discussion, but just uh, a reflection on, on how that could affect the evolution of, of, of the network and the two-lane effect. And then also there was a comment by Emma uh, saying that uh, some of the effects uh, of this... Um, of net neutrality can be uh, that small content providers are squeezed. Um, I, I, I agree, but I have to uh, also put into perspective that there are many other things going on right now that squeeze small content providers. So we would have put, to put that into perspective and, and see how much more is, is it squeezing or not. And also even consider if it could actually be a means of empowering some small content providers. I know this is maybe more complex than current time allows. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the third point, uh, empowering users. That sounds great. Most users do not want to be so informed. They do not want to uh, make so many choices. And uh, they just don't want to control so much stuff. They just want their device to work and their, you know, their information to get to their device. Mm -hmm. So we have to watch out you know, how much weight we put on the user uh, uh, in terms of workload. Thank you. And I will uh, just take an, one last question and then some final remarks because we are really out of time. Uh, I think uh, yeah, Chun was. Uh, it's, uh, just my comment uh, of observation rather than a question. Uh, uh, we have uh, just discussed on uh, the topic of net neutrality in terms of rulemaking, uh, regardless uh, of whether it is hard law or soft law. You know, uh, then throughout my experience, uh, uh, first uh, I introduced myself. I I'm from uh, PeaceNet, Korea. So for the uh, last uh, couple of years, uh, we have. Uh, grappled with the uh, Korean government to, to make some public policy for uh, net neutrality. Then 
uh, quite frankly, uh, my feeling is the um, major uh, debate point of net neutrality was how we can define the scope of uh, uh, discrimination. Uh, we are talking about discrimination, but uh, in many different languages we are using, uh, we are saying uh, discrimination. Sometimes uh, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, taught in, uh, you know, a measurement or control. Uh, or uh, very legitimate uh, 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 management. So in, in many uh, different languages, we are talking about discrimination. Then uh, the uh, real issue, the issue is how can we define the whole scope of uh, those discrimination or measurement or management? You know, the central concern uh, of uh, a net neutral debate is uh, in our society, uh, it, uh, the main topic was how to define the reasonable, reasonable uh, scope of uh, uh, reasonable traffic management. Thanks, thanks, sorry, I, I have to. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, to uh, I'll, I'll finish. I'll, I'll thanks finish. A lot. Okay, thanks a lot. So, so uh, uh, a couple of seconds. <laughs> uh, two seconds. Yeah, you have ten seconds to wrap up your. Uh, okay. Things. Okay. So uh, my point uh, is, uh, which uh, net neutrality debate uh, is concerned with some kind of a power game uh, among uh, uh, interest groups. Uh, so it, it should reflect uh, those power games. So uh, I think the fundamentally important uh, power tools for end users is uh, some uh, relations with its uh, rights aspect. Uh, of uh, end users, so whether uh, it is uh, uh, human rights or uh, communication rights, uh, anyhow, uh, some kind of uh, rights should be clearly defined uh, in terms of end users' rights. That's my point. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir, for your comments. Uh, I would like to ask to the members of the panel to provide some, uh, maybe some, an some uh, an answer to Anna's questions with uh, some final remarks so that we can uh, all uh, go and enjoy some coffee. <laughs> uh, I've talked too much and we've got 10 minutes to get out of the room. So just to say my presentation's on the, uh, the website and Anna and I can always talk over coffee or a drink. So, And I quite agree about the fact that, that user rights are often... The language of, of, of net neutrality is not always conducive to user rights, and uh, one of the good things about the Norwegian model is that it, user rights are very central, actually because it's less formalized in some ways. But on the other hand, we know that Norway has a, a, a maybe almost a uniquely uh, uh, benign uh, atmosphere to, to have, uh, have made this agreement in, so I think that we probably have to have this tedious legal language which looks less like user rights and more like uh, 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 this, this wonderful framework. So, um, so yeah, we need to work on it. Very, very quickly, just uh, maybe probably a call for uh, interdisciplinarity uh, around this issue, like in the sense that uh, we are, I think, a good example on uh, how like, perspectives can complement around this and uh, this can help like, to highlight how uh, issues we are all familiar with as uh, legal, technical, and uh, social scholars reappear in new forms in, in this issue, and at the same time, can, we can learn from the past to address that. Uh, I would answer one, one question about the characteristics of uh, uh, minimum QoS or maximum QoS. Well, typically, um, the ITU has defined uh, a recommendation for QoS for telecommunication networks it certainly is now a bit obsolete, not obsolete, but at least it does not include the internet. I mean, it does not include the IP part of the internet. And uh, that certainly is a gap to close, but it's normally, it's uh, in this institution that the uh, QoS are defined. Now, about discrimination, the problem is discrimination is mostly in the eyes of the beholder, and it is difficult to determine the very specific figures about that. You know. But it certainly exists, but that's a societal problem. Thanks. Uh, just to agree that I think the questions you raise are really interesting and, and much too complex for the time we have. Um, but thank everybody for the, the wonderful conversations we've had and just emphasize that 
how important it is to, when we're talking about these, these issues, um, it's easy to get bogged down in telecom policy and thinking about giant companies and networks pitted against each other, but the importance of, of really elevating users' free expression rights in this debate going forward. I, <clears throat> I, would, I think you raise a lot of really important questions, Anna. I, I would say that we should let users also have choice, though, and have users have the power to make those decisions and whether some may not be able to exercise that or use those tools or you know, realize the full potential of what's out there. Um, we should put that decision in their hands and not make it for them. Um, I think that we've seen countless sort of studies, um, tools demonstrating that this is an, discriminatory practices are happening. Um, we have seen that models um, that fall short of hard regulation are failing to keep up. And even when we do have hard regulation, um, sometimes it's not being enforced. Often it's not being enforced. And so I think that we really need strong binding regulation with strong enforcement capabilities um, to defend sort of net neutrality and prevent discrimination. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, thanks to everyone for having uh, had the strength of being here on Friday morning uh, without maybe coffee. Uh, thanks. I would like also to thank the Council of Europe that has initiated this this uh, this uh, this, uh, this uh, process. I would like to thank all the panel because we are, you have been just wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to Mia. <laughs> <laughs> And also, okay. Last but not least, I also would like to thank uh, to thanks, uh, thank Microsoft that has financed the, the, the printing of this book, because if you have a good, uh, wonderful uh, printed uh, version, is thanks to Microsoft. Thanks a lot, and have a wonderful last day of uh, conference. <laughs>